Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Jose, and uh, I'm going to talk today about uh, creating um, physical cover channels uh, for uh, data exfiltration uh, by using uh, polyglot signals. So the idea is to define all those concepts and um, try to identify ways to generate um, polyglot signals for uh, an attacker and uh, how to exploit them to um, uh, create a, a cover channel and exfiltrate data. And then we will uh, uh, see uh, how uh, it can be detected. So uh, this work was made with uh, my friends Emmanuel Cote and Chauki Kasmi. Uh, we work at the French Network and Information Security Agency in the Wireless Security Lab. Um, our main focus are on uh, electromagnetic security, so it's uh, tempest stuff, um, intentional electromagnetic uh, interferences. Um, we also have a huge interest in uh, radio frequency uh, protocols, uh, communications and security, and we like to play with embedded systems. And of course, we, we have to deal with uh, a lot of signal processing in our day-to-day -day job. The outline, um, I'm going to define uh, briefly cover channels and uh, polyglot signals, and then we will see uh, how polyglot signals can, use to cre can be used to create a physical layer cover channel for exfiltrating data. Uh, and then we will talk about our experiments, uh, the implementation of uh, um, polyglot signals on uh, legitimate uh, QPSK uh, transmitters. And uh, the main idea here is to see how an attacker can uh, um, attack a um, legitimate radio transmitter to insert a companion communication inside a legitimate communication. So we will see um, different entry points that are available for the attacker. Um, we will show uh, that uh, um, some of these entry points that we simulated uh, are um, successful at work. Um, and then we will discuss the detection techniques and uh, the countermeasures. So briefly, the cover, channels, uh, cover channel is a, a way to establish an information transfer um, between two entities that are not allowed to communicate. Uh, by a security policy uh, through a channel that is not intended for uh, for communication. So one big main prerequisite is that um, as we are creating a new communication channel from scratch, uh, both ends, both entities that try to communicate need to know the covered channel and also they need to know uh, which protocol is implemented over that cover channel. So th that preliminary infection is out of this, the scope of this talk. And we will focus on um, the exploitation of the, the cover channel. About the taxonomy of cover channels, there are three big families of cover channels. The first one is the host-based cover channels. And um, the, uh, the concept here is to establish a communication between two processes that are running on the same host. So there are local um, operating system uh, access control rules that uh, disallow those processes to communicate, but they are able to find ways to share information. Uh, for example, by using a shared file system, a file, uh, if they are able to write in the same file then and read in the same file, uh, the two processes can uh, use that file as a storage uh, for uh, sharing information. Other recent research about uh, using shared hardware uh, was really interesting. Um, and the, this drama attack by uh, using uh, a shared uh, DRAM uh, hardware uh, between two processes uh, running on uh, uh, two virtual machines running on the, the same hardware. Uh, and mainly, there are two classes of host-based communication uh, cover channels. 
uh, storage based and timing based. The second family is the network based cover channels. So here the idea is that the two hosts are um, connected. There is a, a communication that is going on. It's a legitimate communication and two processes which are not allowed to communicate again uh, will um, exploit or uh, use that legitimate communication to uh, insert uh, or exchange information. So that topic is also um, very um, old. And um, usually, generally, the information is hidden in, uh, in the protocol data units um, using, for example, uh, reserved fields in the headers or uh, by uh, using the, the timing of the protocol um, to um, modulate or encode uh, data to exchange information. And interestingly, uh, network-based cover channels are mainly focused on um, layers that are upper than the layer 3 of the EOC model. And the third family is the air gap cover channels. So here the idea is that you have two hosts that are completely disconnected from uh, any network and you try to uh, re-establish a communication uh, between uh, two malicious processes, uh, one on each host. Uh, the air gap based cover channels uh, require uh, to use a shared physical medium uh, to modulate uh, information on that shared physical medium. So um, some, of it, some examples could be using light. So one of the hosts has a webcam, one of the hosts has a, a LED, for example, and um, they can exchange information by, by making the, the LED blink and um, monitoring the, the ambient light, for example. OK, now we know what a covered channel is. And uh, today I'm, go I'm, I'm going to, to talk about the, how polyglot channels fit, uh, polyglot signals, sorry, uh, fit in that uh, covered channel uh, environment. And uh, we will see that for me, the polyglot signals for creating covered channels uh, will stand in the physical layer network based covered channels. The concept of polyglot signals was introduced by uh, Travis Goodspeed and Sergey Bretus in 2015. And the idea of they, their work was to, to consider the, the radio receivers are, uh, as parsers. And so, um, as, par as parsers, um, they have to deal with um, uh, uncontrolled information as a, uh, an input. And uh, they try to make it fit to a known structure in order to extract information to share with the, the upper layers. And uh, one interesting idea that came out from this uh, research was that um, all the, the, the parser characteristics, uh, namely the modulation and all the error correction steps in uh, a radio receiver, um, reshape the incoming information and um, hide some of the information received from the upper layers. And so they thought uh, this could be used to hide communication into legitimate communication, but on the physical layer. And they proposed a proof of concept, which was inserting in a legitimate uh, phase uh, shift keying um, communication protocol, uh, over modulating it with an amplitude modulation. And the idea was that the, the legitimate receiver will try to see the phase shifts and extract information from it and it will completely discard the, the amplitude variations. 
and at the same time, the covert receiver will uh, monitor the amplitude variations in order to extract the covert information and will discard the phase variations. So to illustrate the concept, here it's the, the legitimate channel. So um, the two hosts are communicating over a radio frequency link. And um, the protocol is, phase, uh, is PSK based. So um, in each way of the communication, uh, the sender uh, shapes a signal and modulates information in phase over the carrier. And the receiver has uh, specific uh, glasses and only sees the phase variations. And in the other way, it's the same. But if one host is compromised, an attacker could add um, an amplitude modulation over the phase modulation in order to encode or uh, e the data that he wants to exfiltrate towards um, uh, receiving uh, a covert receiver, as I call it. And in that configuration, the, um, the signal that is um, uh, sent is modified, but uh, the legitimate receiver won't see anything because he, has, he still has his specific phase shift keying glasses. So he will only see the phase variations and he will discard the amplitude variations and the attacker will be able to retrieve the amplitude variations. So what's interesting here is that the legitimate link is preserved and it is possible to uh, add uh, hidden information inside the, the physical layer uh, characteristics of the, the legitimate link. So the attacker here basically wants to minimize the impact of the cover channel on the legitimate channel in order to minimize the detectability and he wants to maximize the, his cover transmission quality. And of course, those two concepts uh, involve a, a trade-off. So some of the questions we are trying to, to answer today are, um, in the or original research, the idea was to use complementary characteristics of the carrier um, to um, generate the covert modulation. So the phase and the amplitude, which are completely uncorrelated. So the question is, is it possible to, is it limited to complementary uh, characteristics for the modulations, or is it possible to insert a phase modulation in, in a phase modulation? The second question is, how is it possible to generate a, co a covert polyglot signal uh, by attacking a uh, transmitting host or a transmitting device and the detection of course. So our target was a QPSK transmitter so I won't go into details uh, but basically the simplified view of our transmitter is, uh, is provided here and um, the signal that is transmitted um, in RF uh, is represented by this uh, ugly equation. Uh, and this is the, the receiving part, so the receiver uh, will uh, uh, get the, the first equation, the first signal as, as an input, and then he will try to extract the I and the Q um, values of the sample he receives. Okay. And here it's the, the, the constellation of the received signal. Uh, in QPSK, uh, you have four symbols, which are represented by the, the red circles uh, on the, the constellation. These are the, the four theoretical signals. So uh, in an ideal channel without noise, uh, the symbols that are used to encode the data. And in blue, you have um, the symbols that are received. And we see that in an ideal case, 
the symbols fit exactly, the received symbols fit exactly in the theoretically expected symbols. In a non-ideal channel, uh, there is a noise, and uh, on the receiver side, there are several correction steps. And um, as in the, as proposed by um, um, Goodspeed and, and Bradus, uh, we will uh, try to um, to exploit the presence of the the correction steps to uh, hide information from the upper layers and uh, use the small variations that are corrected by the, the correction steps to encode our information, our covered information. So how, to, how can an attacker really uh, achieve that? We, we asked ourselves the question and um, we noticed that Usually, um, the IQ samples are generated or come from uh, software or uh, embedded hardware um, steps or blocks. And the second part of the transmitted signal is uh, generated by one or several local oscillators, so hardware parts uh, on the, the radio front end. And what this means is that from a software uh, compromise, uh, it should be possible to mess with the I and the Q samples. And from a hardware compromise, it would be possible to mess with the amplitude of the, the carrier and also with the frequency and the phase of the carrier. So we imagine different scenarios about how this could be achieved by a, an attacker uh, on the software level. Uh, it could be from uh, the configuration of the radio front end, um, an on-the-fly modification of the IQ samples uh, that are transmitted from the system to the, the software-defined radio hardware. This could come from a modification of the F FPGA code. And um, to achieve that, uh, this could be done by any malware uh, located on the operating system. And interestingly, in the, the software part, the modification of I and Q separately uh, seems to be easier or possible. About the hardware level, and that's a, a, a very interesting part. Um, the, the, the main goal is to modify the local oscillator's uh, output. And uh, to do that, we, we imagine that, of course, a hardware modification of the PCB, um, adding some uh, components, some electronic components, to, or modifying uh, some components of the PCB that are configuring or driving the, the oscillators. And also, more interestingly, uh, electromagnetic compatibility phenomena. Uh, so interferences from, uh, for example, high-frequency buses uh, located uh, near the radio frequency front end um, could uh, lead to, uh, to an information leak. So to, um, to an alteration of the, the oscillator's behavior. And here, Depending on the hardware architecture of the, the radio front end, uh, a separate operation on I and Q is, is not so straightforward. So at this step, we know, oh, we identified several ways to mess with the radio front ends in order to manipulate the output signal and uh, now we are going to talk about how to modulate information um, using those uh, identified input vectors and how to recover the
covered information that we try to transmit. And for the proof of concept, we interest our ourselves to the amplitude uh, modifications. And interestingly, modifying the amplitude of the IQ channels can be done both from a hardware compromise or a software compromise. So the, the first equation with the blue uh, squares shows the software compromise point of view. So we add uh, an offset alpha and beta to each channel. And uh, we see that um, from the second equation that this can also be achieved by messing with the amplitude, the output amplitude of the, the local oscillators. And as proof of concepts, we studied two, two cases. The first was an amplitude modulation over a QPSK legitimate signal. So this was to reproduce the results from uh, the previous study. And we also simulated the QPSK over QPSK. So basically, in this slide, we, sh we show that the, um, the parameters that we make, uh, that we rely on for modulating our information, um, are uh, propagated on the receiver side. And if we choose uh, alpha and beta uh, wisely, so that um, uh, they don't um, disturb the legitimate communication too much, namely they don't make us uh, they they don't make the sample change uh, quadrant. Then, on the legitimate receiver, the alpha and beta effects will be considered as noise and compensated by the different correction steps or blocks on the legitimate receiver. And on the covert receiver side, we easily show that it's possible to recover the alpha and beta values by comparing them with the theoretically expected values. And more interestingly, uh, we show that it's quite easy in that case. So when uh, we deal with the QPSK legitimate uh, transmission protocol, uh, it's it's quite easy to to recover the to recover sorry the the alpha and beta values. Our simulation results uh, here we compare the the original alpha value in uh, blue on the, the, the top left uh, graph and uh, the recovered alpha value uh, on uh, the covered receiver. So here we show that we are able to retrieve the covered information uh, when we uh, on the covered receiver. So that's what uh, the ASK over QPSK looks like. Uh, interestingly, with our strategy uh, to overmodulate in amplitude the QPSK signal, we just should have to choose the same alpha and beta values. And on the right side, on the constellation, we see the red circles, which are the, the theoretical uh, QPSK symbols. And we see that in each quadrant, uh, we have two values, uh, two, si two received symbols, um, which correspond to uh, the, um, the covert modulation uh, coding uh, zero or uh, one bit. And to perform the QPSK over QPSK, you just have to give alpha and beta two possible values. And on the constellation, you see that you have uh, four uh, small QPSK constellation around each legitimate QPSK symbol. Okay, so we verified that. And of course, we, we thought 
how can we propose something or think of strategies to be able to detect such covert communication. Uh, the difficulty here is that usually um, um, a malicious communication uh, is uh, performed or generates um, packets outside legitimate packets. So with an energy detector you can easily see that uh, besides the legitimate transmission there is another transmission. But here, as we use the legitimate transmission as a carrier, it's harder to notice or to detect the presence of the, the covert communication. And interestingly, again, um, as we say, po polyglot signal exploit the fact that there are correction blocks that will hide so a part of the, the received information from the the upper layers of the receiver. And the idea here is to, to say, OK, maybe we can use those correction blocks to perform the detection of the covert communication. And that's what we, we implemented. So the idea is to modify the correction blocks in order to extract the correction factors in each correction block and then try to monitor the variation of the correction coefficients. And if we are able to um, identify a periodicity in the correction factors, then there is a high probability that uh, a digital communication is going on. And that's what we tested. So uh, the, the top uh, image represents the IQ imbalance uh, correction factor when there is no covert communication. And we see that the, the spectrum um, shows the presence of periodic variations when our cover transmitter is on. We also thought that other techniques could be implemented in order to um, consolidate our approach. And uh, well, those are uh, work in progress, some ideas. But using wavelet transform and blind demodulation techniques, um, especially, you know the legitimate protocol. So you can use uh, modulation classification techniques to identify the probability of the legitimate modulation. And uh, if you, maybe if you do statistics on, on that probability, uh, you could um, detect uh, when uh, covert communication is going on. Uh, so we should, we should try this, just some ideas. And we briefly thought about some countermeasures or good practices at the FPGA level of the, the radio front end. Uh, some researchers proposed um, to monitor the electromagnetic activity of the uh, software-defined radio hardware at startup to verify that the, end, the integrity of the, the code that was loaded at hardware level. Um, all the um, design guidelines to avoid um, the interferences uh, between uh, uh, data, internal data communication buses and the uh, radio front end, uh, radio uh, parts of the, the PCB. Okay, and to conclude, um, the study shows that polyglot signals are very interesting uh, physical layer network cover channels. Uh, it was fun to, to study them and try to reach a strategy to detect them. Uh, another interesting factor is that they can be 
software triggered or hardware triggered. So we have many attacker profiles, and it depends on the target. Um, on the target. And um, and we show that uh, the polyglot signal techniques uh, are not limited to complementary modulations because we, we showed that QPSK in QPSK works and theoretically any modulation should work on any modulation. Um, what will change uh, will be the, the, the covered communication uh, performance and also the impact on the legitimate uh, transmission. We also showed that the, the, the covered channel capacity depends on the legitimate transmission characteristics and on the choices that uh, the attackers make uh, to design the, the covered transmission. And we proposed a detection, a first detection method that is based on using the already present correction blocks uh, and instrumenting uh, the correction factors of those blocks and look for uh, periodic signals in, in those correction factors. So for further work, we would like to explore the, the hardware-based attack. And specifically, the, the interference-based uh, exfiltration and uh, the, the hardware Trojan uh, possibility. And more generally, uh, this study shows that well, there is a need for new detection uh, systems and uh, new monitoring systems, especially on the, the radio frequency uh, communication. So of course, in the slides, you have all the references if you want further information. I thank you very much for your attention, and it's early morning. <laughs> if you have questions, uh, our emails are also provided in the slides. Yeah, sorry. OK. Um, I have a question. Yes. Uh, did you actually test your theories in uh, real-world uh, examples where you have radio interference, noise? No. In, in fact, we the results showed here uh, come from simulations. Um, but um, the, the literature uh, shows that uh, uh, interferences can... Um, um, add perturbations on the oscillators, for example. So there is uh, also already uh, electromagnetic compatibility tests that show the, the susceptibility of uh, oscillators to uh, um, electromagnetic interferences and crosstalk and so on on, on the PCB. Um, but we didn't implement a proof of concept um, for that. Um, yes. So, I have a question regarding the delta, because it was a very nice talk explaining a covert channel on the physical layer, but this in principle has been done uh, already several years ago. So, like 2012, you saw people doing a, a covert channel on QPSK and 16 QAM, for example. Okay. And they also have that software you can download and try it out at home. So, yeah. um, the question is, I'm, I've been looking at your talk, and I couldn't really see the delta, what your specific focus on this is now. Is this the detection, or do you want to do two modulations on top of each other. What specifically uh, are you looking at? Yes. Um, to answer to your question, uh, our, um, we, we mainly focused on the, the, the threats of uh, interferences and intentional electromagnetic interferences on uh, information system security. Um, and that led us to uh, consider the possibility of messing with uh, radio front ends uh, on 
uh, with uh, intentional interferences. And, um, and that's what led us to, to consider this research. Uh, however, maybe we would have saved some time if we uh, ha had uh, the reference you're talking about. So maybe you, I, I would be interested to, to get that reference. Yeah. And also, yes, the detection approach, the, the reflection on the, the different uh, observables that we could use to p perform the detection and the, the idea that everything is already available in hardware or software and just requires a small modification to extract the correction factors and perform some uh, analysis on the correction factors. That might be uh, an improvement, I guess. Uh, sorry, I, I'm too far. So that's Secret Agent Radio from 2012, and they did this on top of 802.11 ANG. But I can't okay. Email that to you. Okay. I don't have details on that. I would be uh, interested in to see what they propose. Hmm. Any other questions? Hi. Hi. Um, isn't it trivial to detect when you've got a compromised channel? Because all you do is have a non-compromised uh, channel between two things and compare the noise performance of that with the noise performance of your compromised channel that's carrying the polyglot signals. You can easily see from the error uh, performance uh, which is the one that's compromised. Yes. Well, yes. Yes. Once you think about that, that's trivial. Uh, usually when you think about something, but before thinking about that, that that's not so trivial, so... True, okay, yeah, this is where simulation and real world don't meet. Yeah, but we thought about the, the impact of noise on the, um, both the reception and detection. The detection. Yeah. I, I guess for the attacker uh, on the covert receiver, um, decreasing the, um, the transmission performance to uh, increase the robustness against noise would be a good strategy to to keep the the link uh, active, I yeah. guess. Yeah. Also, the sepstral analysis of the extra modulation you put in will be different to the noise that you get in a real signal. Yeah, sure. So you can differentiate that way as well. Yes. 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 That's worth uh, investigating. We yeah. we have to to implement our proof of concept. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any more questions? Cool. Well, thank you very much again.